What are the country's top CEOs doing to build extraordinary teams and cultures who thrive even during a pandemic? You're about to take a deep dive into the minds of wildly successful C-suite leaders who are evolving the way that we work in the 21st century. Welcome to this special edition of How to Be Mesmerizing. Hey everybody, welcome to How to Be Mesmerizing. It's Tim Schur and oh, we have another extraordinary CEO with us. Ken Lewis is on the show. Ken, welcome to the program. Thank you. Glad to be here. So for those who may not know Ken, he is uh, an extraordinary CEO and founder of New Rift Distilling. And um, he's also the previous owner of a retail franchise named The Party Source with six locations in Kentucky. And at the youthful age of 70, Ken has been a successful entrepreneur for decades. And he's here to share what he's learned about being a successful businessman who also cares about people. So I'm excited that you're a part of our special uh, CEO secrets uh, series, Ken. Absolutely. Glad to be here. It's fun. Yeah. So let's jump right in. So you owned a thriving liquor store franchise called The Party Source, and you decided to sell off the stores so that you could open your own new riff bourbon uh, distillery or distilling company. So uh, after a few sales of your party source locations, you decided to turn uh, your remaining locations into ESOPs, which are employee owned businesses. So tell us a little bit about that journey and what you learned from doing that. Yeah, just to, uh, uh, you know, get a little more in depth on the timeline, because it was a journey. A journey is a great word, because yeah. uh, journey, uh, you know, implies, I think, a lot of learning and along the way. Uh, mm -hmm. I, at one point, and it was a long time ago, about 20 years ago, I had six stores, six very significant stores, 40,000 square feet and up, uh, with a pretty new concept for retailing and alcoholic beverages. So, and they were four stores in Louisville and two stores here in Northern Kentucky, immediately next to Cincinnati. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the interstate connecting them is I-71. So mm -hmm. I had an apartment up here in Northern Kentucky and a home in Louisville, and I was on I-71 for two or three round trips a week. So I had a lot of time on 71. It was the only place I had any time in my life to think about it. And, and I had some 71 moments, I called them, <laughs> along the way. And the first one, which didn't happen to like an epiphany, I mean, over time, was, Ken, you have, you're running an ever-growing, thriving, you know, business, a capitalist engine here, you, and you're not cut out for that. It, it doesn't make you happy. You know, that's a different skill set. I'm a, a hands-on entrepreneur, get it done kind of guy. All of a sudden I got 350 employees in two cities. I've got lawyers, I've got banks for darn sure, you know, that I have to deal with. Um, I'm, I've lost touch with the things that really matter to me. So the first thing that I learned on this journey was I wanted to jump off that capitalist train and I wanted to get back to a single store and and bring that to as close to perfection as I could. And that's actually the first part of the journey. I sold five stores and kept the one right near me here, the party source in Northern Kentucky next to Cincinnati. And it's since grown, it's well over 100,000 square feet at this point. Wow, wow, that's amazing, that's amazing. So um, you mentioned that you, some, you decided that you were gonna jump off that capitalist train and also to come from the heart because success isn't measured just through profits, which is one of the reasons why I wanted you to be on the show so much, because I just love that you said that. So what do you mean by you had to come from the heart? You know, a lot of times you don't hear successful entrepreneurs and capitalists talking about coming from the heart uh, or that success is measured more than just by profit. So what, uh, what happened to you on I-71? <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, that's at the core, that's, that's core philosophy. And it, wasn't a quick or easy decision because it was much derided and no one understood why I would be doing that. And, you know, you got the successful growing franchise. People wanted to invest and wanted me to go to other States and bring the concept with me and mm -hmm. so forth. So uh, it was a major decision. And, and really what it came down to was not just what did I enjoy doing on a day-to-day -day basis? Cause I was not happy as a growing corporate chief mm -hmm. wanted to get back to more hands-on retailing. Um, mm -hmm. You know, uh, it, it wasn't just that. It, it, there had to be a, a switch in the head along the way that said, you know what? The bottom line is a hell of a lot more complicated than dollars and cents. 
Mm. And that bottom line is my life. And that bottom line is also the type of business that I want to run and, and who profits from that business. So there was a real sea change that, that now feels very natural, but didn't feel natural at the time because that's, that was the major break was to say, my life is not going to be a, a success or failure based on how much I acquire, how many things that I have, uh, you know, how many homes that I own, how many zeros are in my, you know, net worth. That isn't the way I'm going to judge my life and the rest of the world can go to hell. Um, and that was an important decision and not an easy one to make. And I think it's still, and maybe even increasingly a fairly rare decision. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it is. That's especially when you're making a lot of money, you know, and yeah. then all of a when sudden. I, when I sold, uh, and this journey goes on, because when I sold the five stores, at that point, I owned the party source completely free and clear, including the real estate. And that, you know, wow. uh, that, that was a store that at the time, and we're jumping ahead here, that I, I divested and sold it to my employees and started New Rift Distilling. But along the way, but at that time, that was over a $40 million a year store with a very healthy margin. Uh, so it was a cash cow, to be all honest. So, yeah. um, you, you know, walking away from first six stores that were very successful, and then later on, the single store to do it, something very entrepreneurial and, a, and another startup in my life, all those things can only be done if you're highly risk, uh, you, you're okay with risk, you're not, you're not adverse to risk, you right. embrace it, risk yes. is okay and kind of engaging in life. Yeah. Uh, but secondly, it's it's what is going to be the upshot of all this, and that that I think is is a good subject for all of us to be thinking about, uh, so that we're not letting what other people think define our lives, but we're deciding for ourselves. And you know, mine was a very personal decision. Certainly, I'm not the only one who thinks the way that I think. But mm -hmm. once once you broaden your perspective as a capitalist, as a business person, and I'm very much a capitalist. And you broaden your perspective and you say, yeah, that's fine, but profit isn't the only thing that matters. And, and that's a luxury of being a, a family-owned company and a single shareholder that, that clearly a larger company and a company with partners and multiple shareholders, that's a luxury they don't get to have. And so I feel very privileged to be able to make a decision like that. But that's a, that's a mindset and a sea change and all kinds of things start happening when you when you decided to broaden your concept of what profit is. Yeah. Well, like what kind of things? Well, just that uh, uh, that, that led to, to other things. Like when I divested the first, Tim, the first five stores out of six, mm -hmm. I did it the wrong way. I did it the traditional way, mm -hmm. but it turned out for me to be the wrong way. You learn from mistakes. And I'm sorry, people's lives and their families paid for my mistake, but I sold in what's called a strategic value situation. I sold to competitors that would pay top dollar. That's conventional. And I got top dollar. And that's how I paid off all the loans and had the party source free and clear. Mm -hmm. But all their promises about my career employees and how they'd take care of them and keep the same value and ethics, not ethics so much, but value and, and, and benefits and so forth from in the company and for my employees, within a year, every career employee in those five stores was gone because they were paid too much, the new owner said, they were, were, were uh, coddled too much by me. You know, I had a different philosophy of management than they had, and mm -hmm. it's not uncommon, but that stuck with me because while I was acquiring all this money, they were losing out. And I vowed if I had that situation again, that didn't sit well with me and I would learn from that. And that is indeed what happened down the road when I, had to divest the party source in order to start New Rift Distilling. And I sold to an ESOP employee stock ownership plan. In other words, sold to the employees and so forth. Uh, so that, that, like I say, it's all been a journey, 71 journey for me, but a journey in life of, you know, getting my head wrapped around being comfortable enough in my own skin and confident, self-confident enough to define myself instead of letting the very standard ways people think about about capitalism and about business to define who I am in the way that I want to own a business and run a business. Well, I mean, that's so admirable because you had another chance to be able to, to do that. And then you created the ESOP, right? And sold your last uh, store to your company or to your employees. 
Yes. And so you're not just someone who's saying, oh, I, I should have done better. And next time you actually did, you know, do better. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad I got a next time to do well. I, I can't yeah. do anything about what happened 15, 20 years ago. I wish I could. Sure. But at least I've learned something, in my opinion, from that. Yeah. Um, and what happened, Tim, uh, is and for your listeners who wouldn't, of course, know that much necessarily about the alcohol industry. We are, of course, a very highly regulated industry. And we have what's known as a three-tier system, uh, federally regulated, which in essence prevents vertical integration. So there's three tiers. You could be a, you're a producer or you're the middleman, the wholesaler, or you're a bar, restaurant, or a store as you know, the, the on and off premise. Mm -hmm. And there isn't movement between or amongst those tiers. You can be one, but you can't be two of those things. Mm -hmm. So in order to, that's not the way it is all over the world. For instance, in the UK, there's vertical integration. That's a story for another day about which is better, which leads to better control over the sale of alcohol, alcoholic beverages, which after all should and need to be regulated. But in the US, it's, it's a very firm system of three tiers. So mm -hmm. I saw the bourbon boom happening. I mean, mm -hmm. I lived it. I'm in Kentucky. I had the largest store by far in Kentucky, physically the largest store in the United States. I saw the bourbon boom going on in front of my eyes on a day-to-day -day basis. And I'm looking around and I'm going, Mm -hmm. I'm in Northern Kentucky. I'm part of Cincinnati. I mean, you could almost throw a rock to Cincinnati from where I'm sitting right now in Northern Kentucky. We're one metropolitan area. Mm -hmm. I'm looking around. I don't see any distilleries in Northern Kentucky. This is 2011, 12. Mm -hmm. um, why not? We're in Kentucky. Cincinnati as a region is two and a half times larger in population and, and buying power than Louisville the largest city technically in, in Kentucky. Mm -hmm. And there's not a single distillery. There's lots of distilleries even then in, in Kentucky, in Louisville. Mm -hmm. um, gee, why not? You know, this would make perfect sense. So I thought there was a great opportunity. I was getting a little burned out on retailing after decades. I remembered about the ESOP or I had learned about it. I, I knew I wanted to do it again. And I also thought not only can I start a new entrepreneurial venture, which just was so exciting and to get in on this, not at the very beginning of the boom, but well before it was into any kind of a mature spiral uh -huh. or cycle. Not only is it exciting, entrepreneurial juices flowing and get out in that risk and <laughs> build something and put a team together and make it happen, make a mark, yeah. build another great business, just yeah. like the party source is a great business. But I also, it was also part of my thinking, I, I can sell, I can find a way to implement this ESOP concept, which is an amazing concept sell to my employees and literally in the next 10, 20, 30 years, literally well over a hundred families, not just people, families will have a hell of a lot better life and particularly a better retirement. And it'll be because I was willing to jump through a lot of hoops and pay some extra money to make an ESOP happen and not sell to a strategic buyer and lives will be improved. Mm. That ain't bad in my lexicon. Yeah. You know, because I remember, I'm not getting on a plane and flying to Africa and taking on sackcloth and, you know, devote and giving away all my earthly possessions. I sold the party source, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you know, through this federal program. And they paid a reasonable price for it and paid me off early after about six or seven years. Mm -hmm. um, but while doing good for me, I could do some good for other people. That ain't bad. Yeah. Where I'm coming from. Yeah, I agree. I mean, that's the whole movement, you know, of using business for a, as a force for good. You can exactly. be profitable and share. Exactly. And you hit it perfectly. And I think that's a more evolved notion of capitalism that thankfully is a movement in the United States. And there's lots of ways of doing it. And that's great. But I'm afraid that, in, you know, there's lip service and small amounts of money paid at the largest companies because that shareholder burden is so intense and the short-term results that are required are so intense for the stock market and so forth that you need also to look at your structure. And I, again, I feel very privileged to be in a small family business where I can be the shareholder. I am the shareholder and uh, I can make these decisions and, you know, not a skew profitability for God's sakes. No, we want to pay bills and I want a nice lifestyle and all these other things but I can share with my community and with, particularly with my employees and we can build something pretty exciting together. Yeah. 
yeah, it's a win-win. It you know, is a it, win-win. Yeah. So very good. You know, I was watching uh, uh, an interview of you on television a while back, and uh, you had mentioned that you admired first responders, mm. right? And, and how you'd like to look in the mirror and see a hero looking back at you someday. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and I had told you before that story and, and how, um, you know, I, I trained first responders and fire chiefs around the country yeah. with, with the uh, leadership skills and how they would admire you as well. <laughs> and so, um, uh, but, it, you know, I just love, and you've kind of already answered the question, but how do you use your business as a force for good so that you can feel like a hero at the end of the day? Yeah, I, and, and, and I, I don't, I think it bears any kind of repetition that, that all of us out there that are even inclined this way can think a little harder about how we can, how we can share. And it's, it's the, the, the concept I think is pretty darn simple. It's, it's always in the execution. That's very difficult, but I believe very strongly that not only is it the right thing to do from a, like a moral standpoint and, and a way of exercising the privilege that, that I feel personally, I think a lot of people on feel, you know, of, of, you know, the accident of birth, genetic, winning the genetic lottery. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm being quite blunt here, growing up white, in my case, in the 50s and 60s, mm -hmm. a male uh, in those days, particularly the education that I got, I got a public education, but it was a solid one. Two parents who had gave me a good self-esteem, I felt love, mm -hmm. uh, a great college education and so forth, opportunities. I think we have an obligation to do a little payback along the way. And it's not just throwing a little something in the plate passing in church or whatever, uh, to do a little more with that leg up. I mean, I was born, I feel like, you know, at the first turn as opposed to the start line, you yeah. know, and I feel I owe some payback. And I, I, I think many, many other people do too. That's hardly unique. And mm. the final thought about all that is, and it is, you know, I read these articles, so academics are on board in some ways in measuring this, mm -hmm. but it's not all altruistic. The idea of in involving your employees and making work the workplace a, a, a place where there's some pride and some meaning and purpose to the work, as well as excellent pay and benefits, and, and we'll get to this in a moment, but in our case, a pension plan, believe mm -hmm. it or not, mm -hmm. not only is that, I think, the right thing to do, a sharing thing to do, I think, I think it's uh, the productivity increases, which academics have been able to measure in ESOP companies and so forth. The productivity uh, increases and the lack of turnover mm -hmm. and the commitment from employees that, that feel respected and want to be in a career in one company instead of moving around every two or three years. I think there's a payback on that. So it's a wonderful win-win circle. And you mentioned win-win. And I think academics are proving it in many ways. I feel it, you know, on a personal level. I really love that you said that, Ken. And that's exactly right. You know, there's, it's a, it's a wonderful concept, which makes me believe that, you know, there is an intelligent force that has helped set this all up. Because the more you give, the more you get, you know, the, more, the better you feel, you know, when, and then like what you said, when you're helping others to feel cared for and you're setting up. Uh, systems or, or a culture, a workplace culture where people feel valued and they know how their job contributes to yes. the mission that you have that, uh, you know, increases discretionary effort and there's no churn and, and people work harder and, you know, and even if they have to take a pay cut, you know, they'll stay with you and keep working hard because they're, you know, they feel like you, you made them matter, you know, you made them feel like they matter. And that's it, huge. It, it is. And, and uh, focusing on pay alone or, or the, the, the compensation package, not being concerned with our cultures that we have in our workplace mm -hmm. is so self-defeating. And mm -hmm. uh, I mean, after all, all the customer service, all the front facing, you know, I'm in an office right now. Someone else is out there relating to my customers or is out in Indianapolis or Detroit or somewhere mm -hmm. selling new riff. Mm -hmm. They're the, they're the face of new riff. I'm not. And, um, how can it, the way that I treat them has a direct effect on the way they will treat and act and interact with my customers or yes. our customers. So 
Yeah. It, to me, again, it's so logical and mm -hmm. it is so wondrous to me that more businesses uh, haven't, and many, 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 many have, and are finding many different paths to do it. And I think it's fantastic, uh, but many are not. And I wish more would because we then have a more satisfying work experience all the way around. And I think, you know, ultimately a more satisfying society as well. Yeah. I mean, I couldn't have said that better. That's great. So we've already heard some of them, but you have a, four, a few core philosophies or what I would call beliefs uh, that I think are just brilliant. So um, here's three of them in particular. Uh, have an automatic assumption of good intent in all interactions. Let's go through them one at a time. An automatic assumption of good intent, assuming the best in others instead of um, and, you know, immediately assuming the worst. So elaborate on that a little bit. Uh, I, I mean, I think it stands as it is. I will say that uh, one has to be ready to pivot quickly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we mm -hmm. can assume good intent, but at the first signs that uh, this ain't the right strategy, that I'm mm -hmm. not being, it's not being reciprocated, uh, you have to pivot pretty darn quick. But it's a wonderful way to live life. It, it, it's, it's, and many times I think you can avoid all kinds of confrontations and negative impacts and you know, and again, you start with respect with people. I don't care if it's an airline worker or, uh, you know, a hotel clerk or, you know, uh, whatever. The guy picking up your trash or whatever, just have some, you know, how much better is the outcome likely to be with an assumption of good intent and treating people with humility and respect? I mean, it's, again, I'm sorry, all this stuff seems like two plus two equals four to me. Yeah. You know, it would, you would think so, but as they say, common sense isn't so common, common but sense. all three examples of the different uh, professions you just mentioned, uh, you know, I always go out of my way to make people feel appreciated or cared about or respected. You're going to get a better outcome. You're going to get a better outcome. That's right. They take care of you. I've had people take extra garbage for me. I've had people upgrade <laughs> my flights for me, <laughs> you know, fix, <laughs> fix your hotel bill. I mean, that's right. Yeah. Make adjustments. Know, yeah. But yeah. it is surprising we stand around and watch other people just march in and start beating up on people verbally. Why do you oh, think yeah. there's going to be a positive outcome to that? Yeah. Yeah. I, don't know. I mean, you and I agree, but. You know. Well, even if they get their way, some people are raised to believe that you have to fight for everything, right? So even when they get their way, what it does to your body, what it does to the body of the person you're communicating with, what it does to the people who are observing it, sure. the amount of cortisol and stress hormones that fill us. You know, it really robs us of our health, ultimately. Couldn't agree more. We're all, we're clearly on the same page. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So you have another belief, uh, all decisions are better when they are made from the heart. Mm. I like that one. Yeah. So, I mean, we got to use some reason and some logic. But yeah. if you're thinking about, you know, how at the end of the day, and maybe not all decisions are, are you're thinking about it, but a lot of them is what's your end game here? What's the ultimate purpose? What are we really wanting to accomplish here? You know, are we online with our mission, with our values when we make these tough sure. decisions? Yeah. Well, what, what, will I, what will I think when I look in the mirror? You know, will I see a hero? I mean, I'm going to put that in parentheses or in, in quotation <laughs> yeah. marks because I'm no sure. hero compared to a, a first responder. But, you know, will we feel good about ourselves? It, it's not, again, it seems like it's not that complicated. Again, I'm paying bills, I'm taking care of myself, I'm doing a lot of things for my family, you know, but I think if I'm taking all that privilege and abilities that I have, a lot of them, you know, were the accidents of birth and mm -hmm. sharing with others, I'm going to feel better. Yeah, 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 that's really good. So you also mentioned be a giver, you know, and you've been given lots of examples of, of how to do that and how to show up. It's not mm -hmm. just what can I get out of this, but what can I give? You know, instead of what's going to happen to me, what can I bring to the situation? Sure. It's just a more empowering approach. It is. And I think in the end, it's profitable. <laughs> That's the message. Doing good and doing right by other people. I think there's a payback. Yeah. In, in many, not all cases. Yeah. Well, a payback at many levels. Yeah. You yeah. Got so doing the right thing can definitely be difficult at times, um, yet you emphasize the importance of walking the talk. You also once said that um, instead of thinking that your employees are not your responsibility, uh, which I've heard leaders in the past say, 
uh, you should take on the attitude that we are bound to each other, which I really love how you said that, you know, instead of, uh, it, you, I don't have time for your feelings. You know, you're not children, you know, <laughs> I mean, all kinds of things that leaders used to get away with saying that was just like, wow. And they could, because a lot of people would stay in a job because they felt they were stuck in that job. And we live in a different time now. We do. And so, yeah, and with this cancel culture and with holding people accountable and with people having 10 or 11 jobs, <laughs> you know, and, and uh, that stuff just doesn't fly anymore. Mm -hmm. So, but, you know, when you say we're bound to each other, I think you've done a really good job of that already explaining what you mean, but do you have any other thoughts on that? Um, again, just that I think that the entire approach to employment, which is on both sides. It's on the employer side and the, and the employee side that we're mm -hmm. not, we really don't have any responsibility for each other. That as an employee, my career is going to be 10 jobs. So I'm going to be everywhere two or three times, you know, two or three years. And then I'm going to move because I need to move to move up and, mm -hmm. and to get paid more and so forth. Uh, and my employer is, in, is complicit with that whole philosophy in general because they're happy to have me go because I get more expensive as I go on and they're not willing to pay for the experience that, that I bring. Um, and I think that's a pernicious uh, devil's bargain that's going on because one, I think what happens is the employer is, is ultimately deciding that you're expendable because I can replace you with someone cheaper and I can dumb down the job enough, whether that's through technology or because the standards are going down in customer service or front facing employees or whatever, the bar is getting lower all the time uh, everywhere around me. So I can get away with dumbing down the job. I don't need that experience anymore. That, that, that is a downward spiral in general. Uh, yeah. And just to finish the thought, uh, I have one of, one of the things I'm obviously very interested in are retirement plans with ESOP or pensions and so forth. And I, to get into something that just for a minute that's very controversial to say, to me, a 401 plan, while wonderful in some ways, is a tool of that downward spiral because a 401 is saying from the employer to the employee and back again, uh, your career is your responsibility. So I'm going to contribute a dollar, let's say, against your dollar, because that's your choice. And if you're not in it, that's not my problem. You've chosen to be in it. And not only that, but here's the nice thing, Joe, you get to take it with you when you leave. It's mobile. That's the way you sell 401s today. Because when you leave, you take it with you. And then when you leave that job, you get to take it with you. So it's a tool of this downward spiral that there's no responsibility between employer and employee. So I have this unusual perspective that 401s are actually, while they're good in many ways and a good way to help people save money tax-free for, for their working careers, in some ways it's a tool of, of, a, of this downward spiral and the, the lack of respect and responsibility. So an interesting perspective. But obviously here at New Riff, what I believe in is career employees. And that's where the pension plan down the road that we'll talk about uh, comes in. It's a very interesting thought stream. But, well, yeah, let's talk about it right well, now. Because sure. I, I really, I really like that perspective that you have, you know, and, and, uh, you know, it makes a lot of sense the way that you present it. So with a pension plan, how is that? How is that different? Pension plan is, is exactly is diametrically opposed to a 401. Uh, uh, it's a defined uh, benefit plan. A 401 is a defined contribution plan. But, but in the end, the, the pension plan is is a very old fashioned because it's based on a very old fashioned concept, which is I'll work for the company for 25 years or whatever and take as good care of them as I possibly can. And then when I retire, they'll take care of me for the next 25 or 30 years. That is such an old bargain that we're making tight bargain of mutual responsibility, mutual respect. Everything flows from that. And as you well know, companies can't get rid of pension plans quicker nobody's starting them. Governments are backing away from them because you don't want career employees and you don't want the liability on your balance sheet of, of a pension plan. And you don't want that responsibility. You don't want that commitment, all the things we've been talking about. Mm -hmm. uh, we have started to implement a pension plan. 
you know, we will not go through an ESOP here at New Rip. It's going to stay family owned because we need to, to be a great small distillery of the world. It's going to take decades to keep reinvesting and believing in the future and working every day at a, on a high quality basis. And the best way that that can happen. And, and also for me to help future generations of my family is to remain family owned. But an ESOP is just a retirement plan. It's one way to have a wonderful retirement plan. If your stock keeps going up, the neat thing about a pension is as long as the company remains solvent, the company is on the hook. And it's not a quite what happens to stock or anything else is not a factor for your retirement. So you have certainty and certainty in today's world is just a remarkable thing to, I don't want to say gift to employees, but to share with employees. And it's not only the money, the peace of mind that you, employees will have, my employees will have with their future retirement and their families being taken care of, you know, as, as they, as they retire, or get older, that certainty and that peace of mind is priceless. And, oh, yeah. and again, what a wonderful, I don't want to call it a gift because I think it's a gift that pays back, but a wonderful statement of values. And I think it holds true today, just as it did 50 years ago. I'll, I'll, I'm here to take care of you. You're here to take care of me. We're in this together. We're going to mm. build a great product. We're going to stick it out through the many years it's going to take to, to age product and bring it to market. And, you know, and it's you and me together. And we're doing the opposite in most cases with 401s and 10 jobs and that whole mantra out there. So yeah. as you can see, I get up a little on a, you know. <laughs> well, I love it. You, I, get, I get going on this kind of a subject, retirements yeah. and the values that are implicit in those retirement plans. Well, because it matters to you. you it know, does I, matter to me. Yeah, yeah. And I love it. But it that. matters to the employees, too. Even, you know, and 25-year-olds and 30-year-olds, we have to take responsibility for them. They, they're not looking at 65. That's like some bizarre concept that exists in an alternate reality. <laughs> but, you know, that's what leadership's about. It's our, it's our job to be leaders. Because, yeah. by God, when they get to be 50, it'll mean something to them. Yeah. Yeah, so. that's right. That's right. And people don't want to inherently have 10 different jobs. Most of the time, they're not so leaving either. their jobs anyway. They're leaving their manager, right? Or they're just not, the culture's not good, or they're not, they're not being, getting a raise. They're not getting a promotion. Right, right. Yeah, they don't feel like they're being valued valued for what they're worth. Yeah. Or, or, or turning to the whole subject of diversity and inclusion, which mm -hmm. is a hot button today, mm -hmm. it's because they're not being heard. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I heard someone uh, say something that really turned my head a 180. They said, it's not the golden rule, you know, which is treat you the way you, I want to be treated, mm -hmm. which is cool. It's the platinum rule. And the platinum rule means I want to treat you the way you want to be treated. Yes. So in other words, from my perspective, I'm not going to treat this person over here the way that I as a, older, white, male, heterosexual want to be treated. Mm -hmm. I want to see you the way you are and mm -hmm. you want to project yourself. I want to respect that. And I want to, platinum rule is I want to treat you the way you want to be treated. Yeah. And I think that also makes for an environment in which everyone, everyone will be welcome to be in your place of work. That's what people, that's all that people want. To feel, you know, that's yeah. why we talk about diversity and inclusion. Inclusion. And inclusion, you know, to include me, right? So the way that just, I oh, am. Yeah. I don't right. have to put on a persona to go to work at your shop. Yeah. You know, whatever it is. Yeah. And I, I think, as opposed to many people, apparently business people, I think that just, again, <laughs> I'm paying the whole person. Why don't I want to make an environment that gets the best of the whole person? Mm. To me, it's economics. <laughs> That's you know, so good. If, you're, if, you're, if, if part of your head is, is monitoring your thoughts and your statements and the way that you interact with your peers and with customers to make sure that you fit the mold you're supposed to fit, you're not, I'm not getting 100%. Mm -mm. I'm not getting anywhere close. Yeah, I want you to be you because you're going to be a, the better you you are. That's who I hired. And that's who's going to represent New Riff a lot better. So to me, again, two plus two equals four. Yeah, 
that's the whole point of having a great culture. It allows people to feel safe enough to show up and be who they are. And then you value them and then they shine for you. And you want different viewpoints and different backgrounds and you want the diversity. You don't want the same people that have all the same views because where does the creativity and innovation come from? You know, it's the same piece of the puzzle. Everybody's got the same piece. You want lots of pieces of the puzzle so you can see the whole. Sure. All <laughs> yeah. these things. And many, I think many, many companies have figured it out. I think it's easier for a smaller company to effectuate some of these things, but um, it does take some leadership from the top. top. But, yeah. you know, increasingly, I think folks in leadership are figuring all of this out in their own way. Yeah, I really believe we're having a turning point in our history. I mean, we're having conversations that uh, continue to need to be had and, and that more people have a voice and that uh, powerful people are being held accountable now and mm -hmm. in ways that never happened before. So yes. I'm excited for the future. I, I think that good things are, are yeah. happening. Yeah, and it change, change brings friction. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, another way of looking at, at looking at the much larger picture of discord in our society is to say, well, there's, you know, we're at a turning point and there is friction, mm -hmm. but there's, there's forward momentum. Yes. It, it's not, a, you know, landslide <laughs> right. by any means. There's right. friction, there's one step back, forward, one step back. But it, to me, it's a good thing because at least we're fighting about something. At least we're talking, at least we're communicating. At least these issues are front and center instead of, as they always were in the past, so much buried. So. Yeah. Again, yes. I'm an optimist and try yeah. and act on it. <laughs> yeah, entrepreneurs are. We have I to always be. think that if, if something's not uh, the way we want it to be, we'll, we'll go make it that way. <laughs> we'll try. <laughs> That's right. So, well, let's switch gears just for a second then. Uh, your daughter works for you and works with you in your company. And I've had a lot of uh, conversations with family-owned businesses and sons and daughters who are trying to get their fathers to, uh, you know, shift or keep up with the times or modernize. And they get a lot of pushback and resistance. And a lot of times they're like, Tim, what do I do to get through to them? And, and I asked you for some ideas on advice for, for getting through uh, to some leaders maybe that are set in their own ways. Mm -hmm. So what advice could you share for that? Uh, I, first of all, this is a long haul uh, problem. It's not, it's not something that's solved with a sitting down with dad or mom for an hour. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. it, this is a major, major undertaking for all parties. Um, you know, I'm very open to it. I've already started on succession and it's um, two or three years from implementing it, but you have to be that far in advance to do things well in this mm -hmm. particular tough topic, uh, which is family. Families, you know, the best thing about a family business is the family and the worst thing about a family business is the family. And yeah. if you know that and you're willing to tackle it uh, and communicate, which is the essence of everything, that's what happens. I, I will say that most people, especially in the virtual world, now have access. Uh, we went, and I strongly recommend this, we went through a formal program at the Gearing Center at the University of Cincinnati here. Happens to be a fabulous institution recognized around the United States, the Gearing Center, which is the Gearing Center for Family Business. And, excuse me, and uh, they, we went through a six month, you know, every week for two hours. Uh, and it was virtual in our case, because it was just the, uh, last year, but uh, mm -hmm. it could be in person. But in many, in all metropolitan areas, there's folks that do family business, uh, you know, in academia and so forth. And, or even if it's a coach that you employ, but knowing that it's going to take months and months and months to start the communication process. Um, and, and, and maybe it's going to go with friction. Maybe it's not going to come easy. Maybe dad or mom is going to have to hear it maybe from that intermediary or their peers in the case of if it's a group activity or from your coach or whatever, they're going to have to get beat on to just listen, to actually listen for a change and hear the other side. It's all about that inclusion thing too. And, and, the only thing I can say, and I think what we're doing is, is the right way to do it, is it takes a huge amount of time. And as open as I am to it and was to it, I still needed to learn and continue to need to learn and change my evil ways uh, in, in so many ways. Um, that, that's really all I can say is understand the length of time it's going to take, 
and get some outside assistance, whether it's an academic organization like I went through or it's a coach, it's available virtually, if not in person. Um, and take it as seriously. Look how hard we worked and how many years we put into building our business. Won't, doesn't it logical? It's going to take years to figure out how to, in essence, divest and transition to the next generation. Why would you think you could sit down one afternoon and just write it out yourself and boop, it's going to happen. <laughs> and in the way you built it, it's going to, the other end's going to work the same way. It's going to take years. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Well, and you can't take it with you. You know, no, when you, go. you can't. And, and uncle Sam's going to make sure you can't take it with you. So, you know, most successful entrepreneurs, people who've done well financially are pretty savvy about their estate plans. And mm -hmm. look how much work you put into your estate plan. Mm -hmm. uh, you need to put easily that much work, if not more, into your succession plan and transition plan, uh, yeah. particularly if it involves family. Yeah. Well, I always believe that the best leaders are always building other leaders. And so it would make sense that you would be building if you're leaders are your son or daughter, right? Or son-in-law or daughter-in-law, whoever it may be, uh, you know, that those are going to, if, if usually it's not all the kids, but usually there's one or two, but um, they, you, that's who you build, you know, your leadership, uh, you yeah. pour into them for, for years and years. So you should have the confidence to uh, be able to eventually turn those reins over. Uh, you said that's something true. really powerful that we get our evil ways. And I think that it just comes from fear that somehow people are going to screw it up. <laughs> well, you know, that's up everything I work my whole life for or something, you know, but that have you done your job of, of training and, and, you know, in addition to, to son or daughter in the business, any good succession transition family plan involves the sons and daughters and sons-in-law and daughters-in-law who are not in the business. Yeah. Who well might said. end up with, with some shares. Mm -hmm. That's an important topic too. And if the more you can, we can all get this figured out in advance while dad or mom still have most of their marbles <laughs> to help with the process, yeah. the more successful it's going to be. We all know the statistics that family businesses, you know, only 50% survive to the second generation, you know, only, you know, 25% make it to the third and then it gets a pitiful single digits past the third generation. So uh, putting the work in the same work, you, the amount of work you put into making that business to passing it on to the next generation think how hard and rough it's going to be and get into it early and get that coach or academic unit to help you and participate, just start participating, learn to communicate because you know, you've got to come out of maybe decades of being the boss mm -hmm. and all of a sudden you're going to get in there with your family and your sons and daughters and you're going to learn something. They're, they are not interested in you bossing them around about this process. Yeah. They want to be full participants and they want to be heard. Well, that's where we are. Yeah, that's where we are. And I think that leaders to this day, you know, that's, that's always how it is, whether you're related or not, you know, yes. people don't want to be bossed around, they want to be treated like adults. And uh, they want to be heard and they want to feel appreciated and like mm -hmm. their ideas matter. Yep. So totally. it applies for the family as well. So yeah, yeah. Sage advice, you know, one of the things that I heard you just kept saying over and over is it takes time, don't wait. And you know, communication. I, yeah. You know, and I, I'm not, I mean, it, you may think that I'm a good communicator, but on a personal level within my own family, uh, it, they think I have a great deficiency. So I've come to accept I'm not that great at it, but I've tried to counter that. And mm. I, I have it in my mind. Every, we have family meetings mm. and uh, virtually mm. and at early an hour, every couple of weeks. Mm. And I just most of the time I need to listen because I'm keep. Once you, once you get in the pattern of listening, uh, you learn a lot. You, you don't yeah. learn too much talking. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I always heard that the best influencers aren't the best speakers. They're the best listeners. And you, you already know the cards you're holding. You want to, yeah. you want to see all the cards everybody else is holding first, and then you make your move. Right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Wow. So much wisdom. So Oof. Ken, how can people learn more about New Rift Distilling? Well, uh, we like to think that the things we've just been talking so happily about, you and I with a lot of common viewpoints, uh, I, one of the things I say is in some magical way that I can't qu quantify, like a lot of things that I believe, 
Mm-hmm. I believe by running a great company and having a lot of these values, caring about the employees, caring about the community, caring about the environment, so on. I think somehow we infuse our whiskey with some of that. I can't explain it. I, I, can't, I can't document it. But we, we think we're making some great whiskey at, at New Riff. And uh, if folks want to learn more, we're in the usual newriffdistilling.com. Uh, we're at New Riff on all the usual channels. Uh, we welcome visitors. And to learn more about us, we're going to be around as a family business for decades, well into the future. And uh, I'd like to think that when folks try our spirit, you know, what you do in selling bourbon is telling a story, right? Mm -hmm. And we're telling a story right now. And we need to just keep on doing that over and over again, because as we enjoy products, whether it's Louis Vuitton or it's, you know, a great bottle of scotch or in our case, I hope a great bottle of bourbon. I think as you're partaking in that product, you're picking up some of the values and the vibe and the feeling and the, the, of, of the, that's what branding is. It's that making you identify and so forth. So I'd like to think that folks would like to know a little more about New Riff and care about the values that we care about. And hopefully they pick them up just like they get different things when they know a, a bourbon. They're picking up some of our values and our philosophies when they drink our whiskey. Nice. Very good. That's that's I don't drink very much, but it's making me want to have some bourbon right now. Some new riff. <laughs> well, I appreciate that. Uh, to tell yeah. you the truth, uh, all my years at the party source, I'm more of a wine drinker. Mm-hmm. <laughs> am I, am I, in my advanced age, I'm a little careful about high proof whiskey, but I love our barrel aged gin. And on a weekend, I definitely try a little, a little of our great bourbon and rye. Uh, that's great. Hey, I do have one more question just because um, when you said something, it popped in my mind. So um, is there anything that in particular that you've done when you said, you know, take care of the planet as well? Any choices you made where you thought, you know, we need to take care of Mother Earth, you know? Yeah, we, I, we I mean, I this? think... Lord knows the news of late, the wildfires, the, the hurricanes. If we're not convinced about the climate change yet, uh, you know, I don't know what it's going to take. But leaving any of that aside, uh, uh, clearly a business today that isn't sensitive to environmental concerns is, is uh, missing the boat and is going to not, it's going to miss a major sector of communication with their consumers because the world and is in, in the younger world particularly is increasingly concerned about what the heck are you doing about the environment? So just a couple of things that, that we do. First of all, just being conscious. That's, that's solving any problem is first recognizing there's a problem and being conscious about it on a daily basis. But we have a couple of things. Uh, uh, our water source, without getting into any details, we use uh, water from an aquifer that's under us. Uh, we have a well. It's all well water. We don't use river water or city water for any of our needs. It goes right into our mash bill, as a matter of fact. But environmentally, it's 58 degrees year round. And a mm-hmm. distillery takes a huge amount of water to use for cooling. Mm-hmm. So right off the bat, we don't have to have that because we have it from the aquifer. We bring it out. It's 58 degrees. Mm-hmm. Fantastic for cooling. We treat it in, a, you know, in certain ways. We have to bring the temperature back down again before discharging it, but it goes right back into, ultimately to the Ohio River with all the appropriate approvals. That's mm-hmm. one very important way. We don't have a big chilling tower here. We don't need to take that energy source and chill any water for our purposes. Mm-hmm. So and the other thing is we are, there's a byproduct of distilling uh, the leftover grains and water combination, it's called stillage. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's, it's quite a bit, there's quite a bit of stillage that's generated. Well, this is a high protein uh, surplus of all these spent grains after they've been fermented and gone through this and what's left over after fermentation and and then the stilling process, the separation process. Uh, We make it a point, uh, and there's other avenues to do this that are maybe a little easier, but we have developed a very sophisticated web of dairy farmers. And we're, we're really happy that our stillage, this high protein becomes animal feed and we actually have to pay truckers to take it uh, to different farms around our community. But we really like the idea that, that there's a circle of life and it's going back out into all these, we call them our happy cows because most of the alcohol is gone, but not every last drop of it. And they get kind of addicted to it. So we, you know, luckily we distill basically 365 days a year because, you know, even on Christmas day, the cows want our stuff. They don't want what the farmer has to buy. Oh, that's. Um, but anyway, that's a nice little story of, uh, 
Yeah. But, but the, the point there is that in every corner of what we do, if we could do little things yeah. that improve the environment, we start solving the problem. So those are a couple of things that come quickly to mind that we do. Oh, that's brilliant. I love it. What a great way to uh, to wrap up our interview with sure. Happy Cows. That's awesome. Happy Cows. Yes. Okay. Ken Lewis, everybody. Ken, wow, that was absolutely mesmerizing. Thanks sure. so much for sharing. Thank you. All your Thanks wisdom. for having me. I've enjoyed it. And obviously your kindred spirit, it makes the whole conversation go so much easier. Absolutely. Thank you. Hey, it's Tim. You ever wonder why so many talented, hardworking entrepreneurs and business owners struggle with inconsistent self-belief or high stress or procrastination or self-sabotage? Well, the answer may surprise you and the solution is already inside of you. I've been searching for the answers to this for decades and I found them and I put it into a new program called The Power of Your Unconscious Mind, Mental Secrets for Accelerating Success. And because you're a listener, I want to give you a free VIP copy. Head over to PowerMindsetProgram.com. That's PowerMindsetProgram.com and grab your copy today.